Hey everyone, welcome back for more Bio 276. We're going to be talking about hormones. It's actually week number 11, even though I wrote 10. <sighs> Never was caught. Anyway, so we're going to talk cell signaling and endocrine hormones. So our objectives. So cell signaling, again, we had three components of reception, transduction, and response. In animals, we do happen to use protein and steroid signals. So obviously, the protein ones turn out to be water-soluble, the steroid ones are lipid-soluble, and they turn out to bind in different areas. Examples of these would be like insulin or epinephrine, or cortisol and thyroxine. This one here turns out to be T4. So when we look at those, again, to refresh ourselves, this is looking at a protein-based receptor. So here, they're going to be water-soluble, they can travel through the blood, they're going to bind to some type of cell surface receptor, which is either going to trigger some genes or, most likely, a cytoplasmic response directly, because usually what you think of protein-based receptors or water-soluble hormones are going to give you a cellular response. One of the ways that we typically can see this is a hormone is going to bind to what we call a G-protein-coupled receptor. What's going to happen is usually this thing is kept in a GDP turned off state. We add the hormone or the receptor. It's going to cause the GDP to be released, and we're going to add in GTP. That activates the G protein, which is then going to move and cause some other reactions. One of those things could be activation of an enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. What adenylyl cyclase does is it takes ATP, which again is an A with three phosphates, and it's going to turn it into a ring structure, and that is cyclic AMP, which is CAMP. That is an activator for something called protein kinase K, which is then going to do a whole bunch of stuff like adding uh, kinases add phosphates. So this is going to ultimately, in this particular case, if this is occurring inside the liver, is it's going to say, hey, let's break down some glycogen, and we're not going to make any more glycogen. As an example, that would be a cellular response. This is, of course, in contrast with a hormone. So lipid-soluble signals go into the bloodstream, but they usually have some type of transport with them. When they enter into the cell, they usually will have some type of intracellular receptor. This one here turns out to be within the, in the nucleus. This structure here is going to be capable of influencing gene expression, so it's going to be some type of transcription factor, and then we're going to get some response as a result. So again, as a specific example, using estradiol, it's going to have a receptor within the cytoplasm. Part of this is going to have a nuclear localization signal, so it's going to be allowed into the nucleus. It will bind to a very specific gene within the DNA or component of the DNA. We're going to get transcription of mRNA for a protein called vitiligenin, and we're going to then start to transcribe vitiligenin, which is then going to allow for estrogen to do its thing. There are several versions of the cell signaling. So we have endocrine, which is where we put the signal into a tube, typically like a blood vessel. We have things that are called paracrine, which is going to be one signal or one cell that's warning everything right next to it. We're going to see this using something called interferon. We need to look at the immune response. We have things that are autocrine, which is going to be a cell talking to itself. You see this actually quite a bit in immune responses as well. And then we also have this thing called exocrine, which is when um, none of these really show up, but it's you're putting hormones out onto surfaces or you're secre secreting onto a surface. Some hormones are neurohormones, meaning they are released by neurons, and then they go into the bloodstream. So they're secreted like they're neurotransmitters, but they don't bind to nervous tissue. They're going to bind to some other signal. We're actually going to see two examples of this as oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin. So... The thing when we look at hormones is not all hormones function the same way, and some hormones, their job is to cause the release of other hormones or to stop the release of hormones. So we can have things called like releasing hormones. So um, these are hormones that are going to cause the actual secretion 
of whatever it is. So, like, there's a growth hormone releasing hormone, which means it's going to cause growth hormone to get released. Similarly, we do have inhibitory hormones. So, like, there's a growth hormone inhibitory hormone. It's also called somatostatin, which would stop the release of that hormone. And then we could have, you know, what we call tropic hormones. And these are going to cause a tissue to become active and not discrete one hormone, but many. So like there's ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic. So the T is the tropic part. Trope meaning feed or nourish hormone. So it's going to cause an entire tissue to become active. All of this gets regulated through feedback loops. Those you know, releasing hormones and inhibitory hormones are examples of negative feedback. You could also have what we would call positive feedback loops, which is you can induce more and more and more of itself. So this particular picture here is giving an example. Actually, these are two different examples once I'm staring at it. So the one here on the left, this could be something like, I don't know, um, testosterone, where too much of it actually will stop its secretion. But the one on the right, where it kind of positively feeds it back on itself, this could be something like oxytocin, which builds up and it causes, you know, its secretion causes a response that causes more oxytocin secretion. When we look at the endocrine glands, there are some that are pure endocrine glands, which are the ones that are kind of listed here, the thyroid, parathyroids, the adrenals, which are two in one, the ovaries, which are not pure, they actually are multi-use, the testes are multi-use, the pineal gland is an endocrine gland, hypothalamus is actually multi-use, pituitary gland is technically a pure gland, but it's actually endocrine and neuroendocrine, the pancreas is a mixed and then we have others that show up, like your stomach secretes hormones, adipose can secrete hormones, your skin secretes hormones, uh, your kidneys secrete hormones. So there's all sorts of places that we could do that. The point is not to memorize all these, at least in this class it's not. It's going to be, can you come up with like the overall patterns? Because once you have the pattern down, it's now just a matter of applying it to whatever specific situation you're looking at. So, to give an example of a hormone that we would never come across, let's look at insects. So, within the brain, they secrete a hormone called prothoracico or prothoraciotropic hormone. It's a great name, PTTH. And it actually targets the prothoracic gland. So, it's obviously in the front of the, the torso area of the insect. And what this gland does is it's going to secrete a hormone called ecdysosteroid, or ecdysteroid. Ecdysis is molting, so this is going to be a hormone that promotes molting, and molting is a growth phenomenon. So as the insect matures, it goes through molting stages, and it needs this is ecdysteroid in order to do that. But similarly, it's going to be using hormones, a hormone called juvenile hormone, JH, that's released from the brain, from these structures that are called the corpora allata. So corpora meaning bodies and allata. I actually don't know what that root means. But they're going to secrete this hormone. And the earlier or the younger the larva turns out to be, the more juvenile hormone it secretes. And as you know, this insect, the larva, as it molts more and more and more, it actually decreases the amount of juvenile hormone it has to the point that once it's ready to metamorphose into an adult, there's effectively no more juvenile hormone. The point of this is we can see that there are tropic hormones that cause the secretion of hormones that could be constitutively used. And then we could also have some hormones that changed their expression over time. So let's look at some of these fun ones. So like the hypothalamus and the pituitary are kind of need, you need to kind of stick them together as one. The hypothalamus is a component of the diencephalon. Diencephalon is the second part of the brain. 
if you remember, as we go from most basic to most advanced, most basic is the medulla. The most advanced is the cerebrum. Right before that is the diencephalon. Then we had the midbrain. Then we had the pons and the cerebellum. So if we look at that diencephalon, it's basically a massive relay center. And part of what goes on in the hypothalamus is it keeps track of osmolarity, it keeps track of suckling, it keeps track of contractions and stuff like that. It also keeps track of temperature and what have you. So what it can do is if the osmolarity and like uterine contractions are going on, what it's going to do is it's going to trigger cells within the hypothalamus that have their axons run into the posterior pituitary. So the posterior pituitary, if we actually look at it, is actually an extension of the brain. It is also, because it's that, it's sometimes called the neurohypophysis. Hypophysis is the pituitary. So it's basically continuous with the hypothalamus. The hormones it secretes are ADH and oxytocin. So these are technically neuropeptide or neurohormones. This, of course, is in contrast with the front of the pituitary. The front of the pituitary, or the anterior pituitary, is not connected directly to the hypothalamus. It's corrected, corrected, it's co connected, words are hard, using what we call a portal system. The portal system is going to use a series of capillaries, followed by a vein and another set of capillaries. So we have some capillaries, we have some veins, and then we have some more capillaries. So whenever we have that combo of capillary, blood vessel, capillary, we call that a portal system. We're going to see it a few more times throughout the rest of the semester. But the anterior pituitary is not brain tissue. It's actually from part of your mouth. So it's actually a gland. So the pituitary is actually two glands stuck together. And because the anterior pituitary is more like a gland, we name it such which is why it's called the adenohypothesis. Adeno meaning it's like a gland. What happens in the hypothalamus is it's going to secrete releasing hormones, or it's going to release tropic hormones. And those hormones are going to then target the anterior pituitary, and it's going to cause the anterior pituitary to then release hormones. Meaning we're going to have a gonadotropic releasing hormone, which is going to then target, or a gonadotropic hormone, which is then going to cause the secretion from the anterior pituitary of follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. We'll have a thyrotropic hormone released from the hypothalamus that's then going to cause the anterior pituitary to secrete thyroid-stimulating hormone. And we can keep doing that with prolactin. Um, we have, for melanin, we have growth hormone, and we have adrenocorticotropic hormone. So we have all of these hormones that are controlled by the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus will secrete a hormone. That hormone is then going to tell other, it's going to tell the anterior pituitary to release hormones, which are then going to cause some other effect. One of those targets is the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland has a pathway that goes from thyrotropin releasing hormones. So this one here is from the hypothalamus. So they're going to target the anterior pituitary to release TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. It's then going to move to the thyroid gland and it's then going to release thyroxin. So thyroxin comes in two forms, T3 and T4, where T4 is the inactive or not as active form in T3 is far more active, and that's the one that typically gets released. And what it can do is it can cause thermic uncoupling, which is a nice way of saying uh, it can elevate your body temperature. So in a sense, it's a, it's a metabolic 
regulator. The thyroid gland is prone to disease, so there are versions where it doesn't work as well. We call it hypothyroidism. There's spots where it's overactive, and it's called hyperthyroidism. It's prone to have thyroid cancers. If it's upset, it can form things called goiters and what have you. Pa- the pathophysiology of what goes on here is beyond our scope, but for those of you who want to learn pathophysiology, you should learn the regular physiology first. There are other hormones associated with the thyroid. So if I look within the thyroid, there's also cells that secrete a hormone called calcitonin. And calcitonin turns out to lower the amount of calcium ions floating in your bloodstream. So it removes extracellular calcium. The way it does that is it says, hey, let's make some bones or let's urinate out that calcium. This is in contrast with some hormones that are found behind the thyroid gland called the parathyroids. So this bow tie thing here is the thyroid gland. And if I were to look on the side that's facing your trachea, there turn out to be four small glands that would be off color, and we call those the parathyroids. They secrete a hormone called parathyroid hormone, PTH, geniusly named, and it acts as an antagonist to calcitonin, meaning it will cause the elevation of calcium inside of extracellular fluid, which means we're going to break down bones or we're not going to urinate it out. Calcium ions turn out to be rather important. You saw that with how they play a role in the secretion of neurotransmitters or their role in like muscle contraction. The adrenal glands are also a two for one, much like the pituitary gland. It turns out the outside, the cortex of the adrenal gland is more like an endocrine gland itself. And the inside, which is the medulla, is more nervous tissue, so much so that there's actually neurons that innervate the adrenal medulla, but we don't have those that innervate the um, cortex. Within the medulla, it's going to secrete things like epinephrine and norepinephrine, so adrenaline and noradrenaline, and other uh, protein modifiers called catecholamines. We're also going to find within the cortex, it's going to secrete things like aldosterone, which is a mineral modifier, or cortisol, which is actually an anti-inflammatory. It can also secrete things like uh, glucocorticoids. Cortisol is an example of one of those, but they also change your metabolic rate. This actually turns out to be a good place of showing that Hormones can cause different effects in different parts of the body. So we know that neurotransmitters can be excitatory, inhibitory, or sometimes they can be both. This is the exact same thing with hormones. So if I were to take the hormone epinephrine, again, adrenaline, and I put it in the liver, so it has a receptor, you get a response. If I were to take epinephrine and have it bind to two different sets of smooth muscles... It turns out, in some versions, the cell doesn't contract, but in other versions, it does. And the reason for that is it can have more than one type of receptor. And the the result is, you change the receptor, you change the cell signaling pathway. The last one we'll deal with will be sex hormones, because this can be way all over the place. Predominantly, we put things into what we call androgens and estrogens. There are lots of sources of these, so it's not just there's one place that makes these. The default in animals is female, and you have to induce to go from female into male. The sources could be gonads, so testes or ovaries. The adrenal cortex also makes them. And one of the things that we're finding that's causing trouble with sex hormones is plastics can be estrogen mimics. And estrogen mimics effectively lower the amount of testosterone that you have present, which means we're going to have sperm formation issues and we're going to have erection issues and what have you. It also can start to disrupt the balance of what's going on inside of a female in terms of her hormone levels. So, you know, that's a thing. Next time we're going to start talking circulation and immunity.